Welcome once again to Stirring a Bubbling Cauldron. Today, we're talking about entangled locks and ways. All those mysterious little bottles with locks of hair and vials of blood, um, they all conjure those images of a witch at work. These are just making use of science. Again, what physics calls properties of entangled matter. Yep, magic is science again. It's a simple, or maybe not so simple, tag lock. Simply put, a tag lock is an object that forms a link with something or someone, whereby when you make a change to that object, it also changes the thing it's linked to. An energetic targeting system, so to speak. Um, like using a heat-seeking missile instead of a bomb. Perhaps you know it as an aspect of sympathetic magic, where doing something to one part affects the whole. Uh, hmm. Like a hologram, perhaps. Uh, you can refer to episode four for more about the holographic universe. Anyway, in some more mainstream circles, it can also be referred to as witness. But in witchcraft, there's, it's been referred to a tag lock and used for centuries. They can be used to simply increase your focus and power of your intention, or it can have a direct connection to a person, place, thing, depending on how it's being used. Incredibly useful, uh, particularly when you're working at a distance or in situations where the needs may change over time and you want to be able to modify because they easily allow you to change and adapt the effect as the need changes. So, knowing the definition of a tag lock, while interesting and all, is basically useless information unless you know exactly what to use and how to do it, right? Okay, so here goes. The best choice for a tag lock, in my opinion, is any Thing with DNA, definitely. Um, hair, fingernails, skin, blood, any bodily fluid, actually. Um, there's a scientific basis for this effectiveness, you know, due to the concept in physics called quantum entanglement. And again, I don't want your eyes to glaze over, so we're not going to get into that. Plenty of research out there. Uh, it was discovered by Schrodinger, unrelated to the cat, but Einstein famously called it spooky action at a distance. And over the years, it came to be known about, and today, science has shown that certain things are entangled and retain their instant effect on each other, regardless of the time and distance between them. DNA is one such thing. So based on this, objects with DNA are most often and most easily used as tag locks. But there are other things that work as well. Um, they just require more effort. Um, I think the effectiveness of you know the effectiveness of these other things are more connected to using the ether or a morphogenic field or the holographic universe principle, for instance. So while it can certainly be just as effective, they can require a little more practice to be able to effectively access the field you know, on demand rather than just allowing the DNA to make that connect, connect, connection automatically. Uh, so, do you find getting DNA a challenge uh, at times when you want to use it for a tag lock? Why is it that even when someone has asked you for their help, for your help in, in healing, for instance, when you ask them for a few strands of their hair, they get a little edgy and freaked out? The movies, maybe? Hmm. Or is it? Well, if you want some other options, then consider things like clothing. Personal belongings can be used. Uh, an image, whether it's an actual photograph, a sketch, or just an image in your mind. Even poppets, used throughout the centuries. Handwriting can be effective, particularly a signature. Anything that reminds you of that person 
or better yet, anything that person, place, or thing is mentally, emotionally, and physically connected to. Basically things that they consider to be part of their identity. Something they're addicted to is particularly useful, like their favorite cookie, soda, chocolate, cigarettes. It doesn't have to be something obvious to everyone. In fact, it can look like a thoughtful gift. Maybe you're sharing your favorite chocolate bar with them, but that part you retain, eh, you save a little piece, and it stays connected to that part that they ate. Just your pure intention will do it too. You're powerful, don't forget. So if the tag lock is for a place, uh, you can use soil, stones from that place, water, an image, a sketch, either now or the way you desire it to look in the future if you're doing some healing work on the land or the water. To get more creative, remember back in elementary school? Go ahead, have some fun. Make a diorama in a box or a bottle, especially if it's a long-term project for you. So what kind of tag lock you choose may have a lot to do with your intended purpose. So next, let's talk about some applications for working with tag locks so you can better decide. My favorite use is as a healing tool. Now, for myself, loved ones, others, animals, places, even enemies, so-called enemies, can need healing that I'm happy to send. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later. But also, they can be used for anything that you want to affect that's far away from you. Um, or a situation that changes over time. You know, like a, maybe a kid's going off to college and they're gonna have a changing needs while they're away. Protection spells. Staying connected to charms and amulets and talismans that you've made. Deflecting harmful spells or intentions using your own tag locks, um, which, you know, you can call on your protected DNA from a tag lock to maintain or return health and vitality to the entangled DNA, which is your body. So yeah, um, now would be a good time to mention that, yeah, obviously throughout history, tag locks are most often used for manipulative purposes, just too tempting. And I'd like to think that all witches practice win-win magic but, hey, let's be honest, we've all done it at some point in our magical careers. And most of us, hopefully, have learned a better way exists. A better way. Something that isn't so unpredictable or not so nice when you put that energy out in the universe and it decides to come back to you. That's science too, by the way. Law of vibration and all that. But for those who are still considering the left path, let me say I hold no judgment here about your choices, not my place. I only suggest you thoroughly weigh the potential long-term consequences of those actions and then happily face whatever consequences those are, if any. But I will say, for the creative witch, there is always a way to meet your needs from the right-hand path. And witches are nothing if not creative. And maybe the how-to on this creative approach might make for an interesting and useful episode at some point in the future. Drop a note and let me know if it's something that would interest you. I tend to be a bit of a master at it. Self-proclaimed, of course, but aren't we all? In the meantime, know that these weekly episodes that I'm preparing and any of my communications for that matter, are intended to be used to the best interest of all. And spells have been attached to, let's say, encourage that behavior. Okay, that being said, let's go ahead and put them to use. Here are some practical and positive ways I use tag locks. I'd love to hear about the way you use them, so drop me a note in the comments or privately. 
It's all good. As with all magic that affects others, I get permission. Let's start there. And the process of obtaining a tag lock can constitute permission, but not in all cases. And even if I originally have been given permission to have the tag lock, I still get permission to use it. Now, sometimes that permission is not reasonably um, within my reason to get. Maybe the person's sick, just not reachable at this particular moment, yet they have still requested my help with their situation on an ongoing basis. So I can always reach out and ask for permission from their higher self. Just pay attention to the answer because it can be no. Because even a perfect healing is not always in the best interest of someone at the moment. Now that may sound weird, but to support their soul's path, they or someone around them may need to get something like a lesson first, before that healing is, is truly appropriate. And if you jump the gun, they'll just keep repeating that trauma or an illness until they get it. So don't extend their problem. Do no harm. In my book, at least. If you get a no, don't give up. Perhaps you can be given permission to place, uh, to place the catalyst for healing into the ether. So it's available to them, just waiting around for the perfect moment. So you may have gathered most of my tag locks are used for healing. I have a collection, don't we all, of hair willingly offered from those who have required assistance from me for healing from time to time. And when I receive a call that Joe needs something, maybe he's got a cold or, or worse, I use that hair to more easily determine the problem, determine the best treatment, dosage even, and even send the treatment, the healing treatment, directly through that DNA connection. Very useful to have around. <sighs> yes, that healing's energetic. Am I sending him real things like vitamins and minerals and homeopathic remedies? Yeah, I kind of am. No, I actually am. Because everything is energy. And the healing benefits of those things, whether it's a vitamin, mineral, homeopathic, whatever it is, is also has an energetic frequency. It's energetic. So you can send that energy to them just as if they're getting the actual item. In fact, I've come to the point where if I need an aspirin, I can hold it in my hand. That energy goes to where it needs without impacting my stomach and all the other things that are the negative parts of taking that aspirin. Anyway, that's another matter. Uh, it's quite effective, let's just say. Whether you're using an actual radionics machine, and yes, that's a thing, or your pendulum, or solely using your intention. So, Think a standard bottle, amulet, or talisman spell must be near the person, worn on the body, to be effective? Well, not when using a tag lock. And you know, I love knowing the science behind something. It allows me to evaluate, rather than wonder, whether an approach I'm taking is likely to have success. So if you aren't aware of the science behind these, welcome to the club you can know what to use to meet your needs as well, much more easily now. Here's another idea I love. Fast, easy self-care. At your, uh, hmm, at the tips of your fingers, shall we say? And never-ending supply, because they keep growing back, right? We all need self-care. What do you struggle with the most? And what emotional challenges recur for you and your family in your life? You may want to consider pre-made bottles, bottle charms, to have on hand for a variety of situations. Then, when you need it, add your hair or your nail trimmings temporarily to whichever one will most meet your need at the moment. Now, once you have bottle charms created, solutions are immediately available to you. Because, you know, when you're sick or frustrated, angry, 
It's not the ideal time to cast an effective spell anyway. Might as well have them in advance. These things are really personal. So, for instance, if rose petals are supposed to bring loving feelings, but you don't like roses, don't use them. Duh! Meet your needs. Maybe your needs are better met by throwing some chocolate chips in that bottle. Maybe that's what makes you feel safe, loved. And don't rule out unconventional things. Now, come on, I wouldn't put any mac and cheese or mashed potatoes in there because yeah, rancid, moldy spells are just not good eats, to coin one of my favorite foodies. But something like a calm the fuck down bottle yeah, well, that could be useful. What settles your nerves and calms you down? A little lavender, perhaps? Maybe even toss in one of those tablets out of that homeopathic blend, uh, Calms Forte? Well, as an herbalist, I tend to start with plant energies. Herbs possessing, you know, possessing those medical properties that I'm aware of. And thanks to the internet, there are plenty of resources for commonly used correspondences. But you know, just choose what's meaningful for you. Because that's what's perfect. That's what's perfect for you. Better than anything you're gonna find as a norm for anyone else. Okay, here's another one. Consider a relaxation bottle. Might include things like, you know, chamomile, lavender, valerian, bergamot. Now, not that many of us have actual bergamot in the garden or a bottle of extract on the shelf, but improvise. Come on, be creative. You're creative. Use a little Earl Grey tree tea in there. That works. Throw a little weed in there. Anyway, a sleep bottle. Maybe an energy focus bottle. A de-stress bottle. Oh, how about a fuck off bottle? When you just need to say it, mean it, and let it go. Mm, need some quiet time? Maybe a leave me the hell alone bottle. Or maybe you need to make a run to the store without anyone approaching you while you're there or running into anybody you know that wants to have a conversation. That's a good bottle. You beating yourself up about something? Well, maybe a self-love and acceptance bottle. Or an emotional support bottle for those times when it just Feels like nobody's there backing you up like you need them to be. Do it for yourself. Because we're the ones we rely on anyway. So go ahead. Make some healing bottles. Not just for emotional things, but for those physical things that get you down as well. Maybe an arthritis bottle to settle pain and inflammation. Or a cold and flu bottle. Because that one's easy. Man, add some eucalyptus and rosemary. Um, maybe garlic or other natural antibiotics. Oh, some fire cider, one of my favorites. The Ganesia gumweed. The possibilities are endless, seriously. Whatever makes you feel better. Good digestion bottle. That's always useful. Oh, and a Hyuga bottle. Okay, spelled H-Y-G-G-E, cause if you're like me and only saw it written down for years, <laughs> I thought it was a Hyuga bottle. Okay, so here's some things for your edgy bottle. Some threads from your favorite cozy blanket. A corner torn from your favorite book. Pinch of your favorite tea. A little ash from your last hearth fire. Even a piece of that broken glass from your favorite mug that fell or was thrown to the floor. Here's one. A spell casting bottle. Okay, okay, hear me out on this one. Really powerful stuff. A spell casting bottle would have anything that anchors you to that spell casting state of mind for you. Maybe a representation of a god or goddess if you use deity energy to connect. The elements, an energetic symbol of power for you, like a sigil. Uh, a torn corner from a BOS page that recorded a particularly successful spell for you. Something representing your ancestors to bring their power and wisdom. Um, the options are endless and very personal. So my spellcasting bottle will look nothing like yours. 
Well, I hope I've given you some good things to think about. Give me your good ideas, because, hey, this ain't a one-way street. I'm sharing with you, yeah, and I like you and all, but send it on back to me. So now that you've got some good ideas, hopefully, and I've sparked a bunch more good ideas in you that I didn't mention, what do you do? Okay, those lovely little corked bottles are fun, commonly used for this, sealed or not. But there are many other more fun and interesting things you can use. Um, get out of the bottle sometimes. Remember, more and bigger is not always better unless it fills a specific need. And consider aesthetics as well, not just the beautiful little bottles. Where will you store it? Will it be out in the open? Where are you going to store it more discreetly? Looking for a way to infuse more ongoing state of mind or being for someone like that child going off to college that you want to send them with a gift of love. Here's an idea. Do you paint? Doesn't have to be good. Just paint. Because guess what? Hair, nail trimmings, they stick to wet paint. And they remain inconspicuously on the wall or in the picture frame on the mantel or night table. It can even be the frame, in case they get tired of the picture. Every time they look at it or think of you, it's like adding more of your love and intention. <laughs> the art doesn't have to be good. Seriously, it can be very abstract. A picture painted with love and infused with herbs and meaningful correspondences, or even just pure intention to make that person feel deeply loved and appreciated, works wonders. Adding a tag lock infuses that directly into their DNA at a deep level and helps overcome many an external factor that could wear them down. Now, while this may sound like a love spell, stop right there. I'm opposed to love spells, as I know many of you are, because they impact people's free will and usually backfire. This is not that. This is for self-love and care, even for yourself. It's not for creating an attachment to another person. Remember, I've put safeguards in place. Whether for yourself or someone else, consider the practicality of the object. Can you really carry it around with you? Do you need to? Hmm, well, not with tag locks, right? And if you give an object away to a person, consider what might happen if they dispose of it or it gets stolen or damaged. Because getting splattered or accidentally dropped into a vat of beer at the frat house may not add anything good to your original intention. I can't get into the intentional disposal of such charms here because that can vary so widely depending on the contents, but you can set a spell in advance so that if it's no longer serving its highest intended benevolent purpose, the energy connection will self-destruct. I love adding safeguards. Since my main purpose, using tag locks, is for healing others, unless it's predefined healing solution like we talked about earlier, I choose not to add other elements to my tag locks. Because that might affect a future diagnosis or treatment results you know, that I'm inquiring about at some point in the future. But there are circumstances when it makes sense. You decide. Maybe like the example of a child leaving for college who you want to always feel loved and using their higher wisdom. Then you would want to add correspondences, yes, to keep those attributes connected via the tag lock without your constant involvement. Yet, they might call that they've got the flu and you want to open the bottle and add a little something appropriate at the time. So I usually leave my options open and choose not to uh, seal charm bottles. Even the best spells might need to be tweaked from time to time. Hmm. Maybe that child away from college is feeling so loved and accepted, good job, uh, that you need to temper that with a little more compassion at some point. Options are good. So if you've sealed those bottles, like the pre-made bottles we talked about earlier to preserve freshness or for whatever reason, you can allow that bottle to float in a glass of water for a while. 
energetically infusing the properties, and then remove the bottle for future use and drink the water. Water has memory and can be a very powerful magical tool, uh, think Emoto for instance, and will carry your instructions throughout the body very quickly, acting as a quasi homeopathic messenger to every cell in your body. Oh yeah, speaking of every cell in your body, uh, not to add an ick factor here to an otherwise uplifting session, but remember if you're using body fluids, don't let them go rancid in your bottle. That's just disgusting and, and does not make for a good spell. Well, um, unless the results you're looking for are in fact disgusting. It also bears saying that bodily fluids carry disease. Well, you get it. Enough said about that. So what the Beetlejuice? Does some of this sound extremely unconventional? Good. Stir in the pot, right? Don't you dare always grab and use what's floating at the top of the cauldron. Might be pond scum. Anything overused or bloated and floating may not be ideal for you. Hm. A friend of mine told me the other day that he was once told he had a bad magical teacher because he doesn't use magic in what some consider to be traditional ways. Good for you! Because you know what? You and your inner guidance are your best and perhaps should be your only magical teacher. Yeah, I know. Magical people of old, the old time witch. They apprenticed with someone more skilled than they and learned their ways. Usually an ancestor chose a descendant who showed interest and aptitude for the craft, but those personal ways were already in their DNA in some level. Even if they, they wrote down those spells cryptically, uh, because they were secret, the explanation of the energy behind them was not written down, lest they be found. It was a very mysterious and secretive business. And I seriously doubt there were mass conventions where all these ideas and methods were shared and matched one to another. So what we think of as traditional approaches to magic are likely only from a few who wrote them down much later. And those original authors were in many cases not actual practitioners, but someone who heard about the practice and probably did not understand it on an experiential level. Only what it looked like from the outside or what someone else who maybe received the treatment and also didn't understand it reported to them. These matters were hidden and quite personal. Yours can be too. Don't let anyone tell you your ways are wrong. If it feels right to you, and you get the results you expect. So by all means, get creative sparks from wherever you find them, but make the magic your own. Until next week, live using and believing in the power of magic.